Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we continue on with Prairie Dogs with the story Dog Town Digging from the book Watched by Wild Animals, written by Enos A. Mills. John picked this story out. He said to me, Dad, can you do another prairie dog story? And if you can't find a prairie dog story, can you do one on an ant eater? He asked for a third animal, but I forgot what he asked for. It's okay, though, because I found another prairie dog story. From the preface of the book, it sounds like Mr. Mills actually did go out and hang out in nature for a bit, and the book came about from his observations during that time. I hope that you are getting some nature time in. For me, the other day, I was taking the dog out to use the bathroom. When she was using the bathroom, I did some backyard observations. My observations included black squirrels, blue jays, a woodpecker, doves, and a miniature schnauzer. Oh wait, the last one was Abby, not a wild animal. Wherever you are, stop and take a moment to check out the scenery. Whether it be in a large metropolis like Detroit, or a small town where everybody knows your name, there is bound to be something cool or fun to look at. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Dogtown Diggings About 30 years ago, a cowboy took me out to see the big dog town. This metropolis was in the heart of the Great Plains near the Kansas-Colorado line. For five hours, we rode westward along the southern limits of the town. It extended on over the horizon more than two miles wide and about 40 miles long a town with a population of two million. Its visible inhabitants would have astounded a census taker or a dog catcher. Thousands of prairie dogs were yipping and barking more than 60 times a minute, and stub tails were whizzing away at the same time. We rode out among the crowded and protesting dogs and stopped to watch them. A number ducked into their holes. Around each hole was an earthy collar less than two feet across and four or five inches high. At a distance, this earthy collar surrounding the hole had the appearance of a low mound. Evidently, this mound is to keep out storm water. There were thousands of these holes, each with its dog. One nearby dog sat up on his mound like a ten-pound sea lion. He watched us with concentrated attention. His tongue and tail were still. When my hat started toward him, he simply dropped into the hole. There were scattered holes which had a rabbit or two little owls at its doorway. Throughout the town were little orchards of dwarfed sagebrush and a scattering of tall weeds. A showy bed of prickly pear cactus inside the town limits was not inhabited. The prairie dog is a sun worshipper. He keeps aloof from localities where willows are an enemy hiding screen and where trees cast a shadow. His populous cities are in arid lands where for 300 days each year they have their place in the sun. The dogs seemed to be ever moving about, visiting or barking. A young dog near me ambled over to visit another. These two called on a third, and while in session were joined by ones, twos, and companies until there were several dozen massed. 
A young dog left his hole top after a survey and started off for a call. When he turned aside to join and mingle with the crowd for a minute or two, they went on with his call. All this time, there were several dogs behind me, energetically protesting at or about something. Cheerfulness and vivacity characterized this fat, numerous people, but they were always alert and commonly maintained sentinels scattered throughout the town. While numbers were visiting or playing, a few were feeding. They appeared to feed at all times of the day, but I do not believe that they eat half the food of the average woodchuck. The short grass was the principal food. They also ate of the various weeds around. I do not recall seeing them eat the bark of sagebrush or any part of the prickly pear. Prairie dogs must materially assist in soil formation. Their digging and tunneling lets dissolving water and disintegrating air into the earth and deepens the prairie soil. The congesting population in time increases the soil supply. In places and for a time, this new soil seems to be helpful in increasing the food supply. But after a time, in many towns, food becomes scarce. Food scarcity causes movement. I have heard that the entire population of a dog town, like an entire species of migrating birds, will leave the old town and trek across the plains to a site of their liking. A generation ago, the prairie dog population must have exceeded 200 millions. It was scattered over the Great Plains and the rocky region from the Canadian line to Mexico. Dog towns are dry towns. My cowboy friend had repeated to me what everyone thus far had told him. Prairie dogs dig down to water. Prairie dogs, snakes, and owls all use the same den. The water supply of dog towns and also their congested life so interested me that I visited a number of them to study the manners and customs of these citizens. For two months, not a drop of rain had fallen in Cactus Center. Not a bath nor a drink had the dogs enjoyed. I hurried into the town immediately after a rain thinking the dogs might be on a spree. I had supposed that they would be drinking deeply again and swimming in the pools, but there was no interest. I did not even see one have a drink, although all may have had one. A few dogs were repairing the levee crater rim of their holes, but beyond this things went on as usual. The rain did not cause Dogtown to celebrate. On a visit to the biggest dog town in the world, near the staked plains in Texas, and where there were dogs numbering many millions, I watched well drillers at a number of places. Several of these wells, in the limits of Dogtown, struck water at 300 feet, none less than this depth. This told that dogs did not dig down to water. They are busy diggers and have five claws on each foot, but they do not dig through geological ages to obtain water. One day, two cowboys came along with a shovel, which was to be used in setting up a circular corral, and I excited their interest in prairie dog dens. We made the dirt lively for two hours, but we did not reach bottom. I examined old and new gullies by dog towns, but learned nothing. Finally, a steam shovel revealed subterranean secrets. This steam shovel was digging a deep railroad cut through a dog town. The dogs barked and protested, but railroads have the right of way. The holes descended straight and almost vertically into the earth to the depth of from 10 to 14 feet. From the bottom, a tunnel extended horizontally for from 10 to 40 feet. There was a pocket or side passage in the vertical hole less than two feet below the top and a number of pockets or niches along the tunnel with buried excrement in the farther end of the tunnel. 
The side niches were used for sleeping places and side tracks. There was a network of connecting tubes between the vertical holes and communicating tunnels between the deeper tunnels. I found the underground works of the dogs similar in other railroad cuts. None of the holes reached water. In fact, they were extra dry in the bottom. Prairie dogs, in common with many species of plants and animals of the arid districts, require and use but little water. Dogs do without water for weeks except such moisture as is obtained from plants eaten. A part of each year, the plants are about as dry as dog biscuit. There were from a few dozen to a thousand dogs upon or in an acre. From a few holes to more than 100 in the area of the size of a baseball diamond. Although the plains had numerous large and populous places, there were leagues without a single dog. Apparently, the dogs keep on the higher and the well-drained land. One day, I watched some fat, happy puppies amusing themselves. They played, but without much pep, while mothers remained near to guard and to admire. Prairie dogs often play, but never, I think, alone like the grizzly. In groups and in hundreds, they played the universal game of tag. They were fat and low-geared, and the running gallop made an amusing effort to get somewhere. There were several boxing exhibitions or farces. Their fat bodies and extremely short legs and slow, awkward movement made their efforts more ludicrous even than those of fat men boxers. There was a kind of snake dance which entangled countermarching in which most dogs tried to be dignified while many acted as though in new company and did not know what was expected of them. One of their plays consisted in a single dog mimicking a stranger or an enemy. A bunch of dogs acted as spectators while an old dog highly entertained them by impersonating a coyote. At least his exhibition reminded me very much of coyote. The old dog imitated the coyote's progress through Dogtown, with the usual turning, looking, smelling, and stopping. He looked into holes, rolled over, bayed at the heavens, and even tried the three-legged gallop. During most of his stunts, the spectators were silent, but toward the last he was applauded with violent cursings and denunciation, at least so it sounded. A number of other folks were imitated, but just who they were, my natural history and the actor's presentation gave no clue. Apparently the skunk was imitated, the actor's impression was good, the congested audience watched him closely, with now and then a yip, but mostly in silence. But sometimes there are less peaceful scenes in Dogtown. A dog town without a coyote would be like Hades without Mephistopheles. The prairie dog likes to keep close to his hole, or to the hole of a neighbor into which he can duck and escape the surprise raids of the coyote. The coyote stalks patiently, hiding until a dog comes close or is too far from his hole to outrun the coyote to it. Coyotes hunt in pairs or fours, and often, while one, two, or three of them are holding the attention of the dogs, the other coyote makes a sudden dash. Sometimes they take sheer delight in stirring up things in congested corners of Dogtown. As I stood watching them, screened by the cottonwood, two coyotes crossed the corner of Dogtown and set it all agog. While these coyotes made their way leisurely through Dogtown, the dogs sat on their crater-like mounds and uttered rapid-fire protests, ready to drop into safety in case of a rush by the coyotes. Suddenly, two old dogs wheeled and yapped at highest rattling speed. While the first pair of coyotes was attracting attention, a second pair appeared. The old dogs violently denounced the second pair for the surprise, but the coyote is ever doing the unexpected. 
On the outskirts of Cactus Center, numerous pairs of coyotes had a 